Number, please. Thank you. 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 Eva Curtis had no idea that by the time Thanksgiving 1918 was over, she would be hailed as a hero. The factory where she worked would be mostly gone in a fiery explosion. Number, please. And the town of Trenton would come within inches of being totally destroyed. Number, please. Number, please. Number, please. Please hold. I was told initially there's nothing on this, it's forgotten, it's, it's the past and so forth. But I kept coming back to, uh, I was teaching I think a grade 10 class at Trenton High at the time. And that's why I started this thing. Because students in my class would tell me about going there and picking up pieces of TNT and, and they, they were, you know, very open about it, it was just lying around. And that kind of intrigued me. I kept thinking, there's got to be a story here. This is the story of the British Chemical Company and the legacy it left on Trenton, Ontario. Trenton is no stranger to industry and has been a servant to its strategic location for more than 400 years. People have lived and labored on the shores of the Trent River even longer. With the downturn of the lumber industry and the loss of the Gilmore Lumber Company mill in 1910, Trenton was a place in need of jobs. The jobs would come, risky jobs in an industry shrouded in the secrecy of war. Munitions and high explosives would become the industry of the day and the British Chemical Company would set itself up on the banks of the Trent. Many people in Trenton were afraid of British Chemical. They felt it was only a matter of time before it blew up and destroyed the community. And it probably wouldn't be correct to say the disaster completely faded from historical memory. It's just, eventually, it begins to take on the sound of a legend or a folktale. Few people residing in the area even know it happened. Today, grass and brush cover the ruins. Rotting cement and what bricks are left have turned to powder. To the casual observer, this is a dead place, eerie in its solitude, breathtaking in its scope, sobering in its fate. This spot, where thousands of men toiled to put bread on the table, is now 
part of the past. This is the story of the largest and most controversial industry that ever existed in the city of Quinty West, Ontario. The story of an industry which came to and disappeared from the area all within the space of four years. In 1914, what would later be called the Great War shattered the peace in Europe and altered the tide of human history. The insatiable requirements to participate in such massive ordeal not only needed men, it needed mountains of resources. The face of war had changed, mechanized. The troops involved needed supplies, food, clothing, transportation, guns, and ammunition for those guns. That was why, in mid-September 1915, a firm known as the British Chemical Company, with the continuing and active encouragement of the Canadian government of the day, made the decision to build the largest explosive plant in the British Empire at Trenton. This great plant, which at its peak employed over 3,000, would come as a godsend to the community of 4,500. Unfortunately, this godsend would later bear most of the earmarks of a curse. Thanksgiving weekend, 1918. For the first time since it had begun full production a year and a half before, much of the British chemical plant had been shut down so workers could have a holiday. Even though the war was dragging on and with contracts to fulfill for allied countries. So granting a plant-wide holiday, although extremely fortunate as events would later indicate, was a very unusual occurrence in the chain of events leading up to the explosion. Only a skeleton work crew remained to man one of the more intricate processes, those in the nitrating plant. These workmen were mixing acids required in the manufacture of TNT. Beginning at 6.12 p.m., a chemical plant employee set in motion a faulty nitrating process. In a subsequent report on what happened, Mr. Nobel W. Peary, Director of Explosives for the Imperial Munitions Board in Ottawa, explained, our practice has been to add approximately 3,700 pounds of oleum to the dye oil at a temperature of 75 degrees C, followed by a mixture of 1,750 pounds of strong acid mix with 800 pounds of oleum added at a temperature approximately 90 degrees. This, however, was not done. Instead, a mixed acid containing an unusually high percentage of oleum was run into the nitrator at a temperature a little above 50 degrees C. Apparently, little reaction occurred at this temperature. As the temperature was raised, the rate of the reaction increased and to such an extent that it could not be controlled by the cooling means provided. Such a large quantity of heat was developed during such a short period of time that the temperature of the nitration rose until ignition occurred. While the official report of the investigation sounds rather dull, the actions of the men nearest the accident indicate near panic. A foreman saw the temperature in the nitrator start to rise alarmingly. At first, he seems to have shrugged off the danger, but then when the situation began to get out of hand, he started giving orders and running from building to building in desperation. The nitrator, which to a layman was somewhat like a huge pressure cooker, got hotter and hotter. Fire hoses were brought in and water sprayed on the outside of it, but even then, the temperature continued to shoot upwards. Suddenly, a jet of boiling acid shot through the measuring hole in the top of the machine. Chemicals spilled down over the sides and began to spread across the floor of the building. As this was happening, clouds of deadly fumes filled the place. Then, the boiling acid ignited. Sheets of flame engulfed the nitrator building as screaming men frantically rushed outside. Men gagged and choked as they tried to fight the fire. Within minutes, it was beyond them. The foreman smashed a glass in the fire alarm and switched on the main siren. Then he ordered his men to forget the hoses and run for their lives. Within minutes, the first explosions came. News flash. The miracle of Trent is the one thought in the mind of everyone today after a night of terrifying explosions in the munitions plant which rocked the town. 
broke almost every pane of glass and were heard for miles around, while masses of flames from burning chemicals leaped hundreds of feet straight up into the air. But the officials state that as far as they know, no life was lost and no one was injured. As the town rocked from the force of the explosions and the houses trembled and glass smashed, the residents became panic-stricken and picked up whatever was handy as fled into open country. Soon every road leading out of town was crowded with hundreds of people some only partially dressed, mothers carrying babies, families were separated in the panic, and the night was one long to be remembered as a hideous nightmare. And for most people in Trenton, that is the story that has been told for the last 100 years. Rumors, conspiracies, and speculation have always surrounded the accident in one form or another, even in popular culture. Canadian poet Al Purdy wrote, a splinter in the heart, coming of age story that unfolds against the real life tragedy of what came to be known as the Trenton disaster. Also, Carry On Sergeant is a 1928 World War I drama that is considered to be one of the earliest Canadian feature length motion pictures and was actually filmed in Trenton, he alludes to conspiracy and sabotage of a munitions plant. After so many years, it is almost impossible to know the truth. However, it is important to remember what happened, because this is our history, our story. So how did we get here? In 1916, an article in the Times of London proclaimed that an insufficiency of munitions and shells is leading to defeat for Britain on the battlefields of World War I. The article sparked a genuine crisis on the British home front, forcing the creation of a Ministry of Munitions. British munitions production was not operating at full efficiency, nor anything approaching it. To address the shells question, the Ministry of Munitions, headed by David Lloyd George and then R.H. Brand, was formed, and over the course of 1915, the Ministry would answer the Army's concerns with an increased emphasis on advanced weapons technology and the production of more powerful artillery. The Imperial Munitions Board was the Canadian branch of the British Ministry, set up in Canada under the chairmanship of Joseph Wesley Flavel. The board was mandated to arrange for the manufacture of war materials in Canada on behalf of the British government. Because the private sector was unwilling or unable to operate in certain fields, the board established seven national plants controlled by the British government for the production of explosives and propellants. It also formed subsidiaries to perform several of the manufacturing functions, which were spread across Canada. One of those subsidiaries was the British Chemical Company. British Chemical purchased 255 acres of land on the east side of the Trent River, an area encompassed today by the Canadian Pacific tracks at West Street, the Grand Trunk tracks above Number One Dam, the riverbank on the west and Sydney Street on the east. But even though much of the acreage has now been developed, there still remains surprisingly huge chunks of open space. No one who really looks at the area today can fail to visualize and be somewhat awed by the scope of what once was there. There were several reasons why Trenton was chosen. The town was situated on Number 2 Highway, the main trans-provincial roadway at the time. But of even more importance as far as the explosive company was concerned, efficient and frequent rail service connected Trenton with communities and industries in all parts of Canada and the United States. In addition, the plant was built beside the Trent River, thereby ensuring an unending supply of fresh water for the company generators, while at the same time providing access for the shallow draft colliers, which unloaded nearby. Trenton was also blessed with an adequate supply of electrical power and reliable telephone and telegraph service. A last, but no less vital reason for building the plant on the particular site in question involved the terrain. In 1915, there were several small hills scattered at various locations back from the river. Two of the largest, one named Honeysuckle Hill and the other Bunker Hill, are still there today, although both have graded somewhat over the years so that they do not seem to be nearly as imposing as they must have been years ago. It was among these hills that the 204 company buildings were built. The trinitro toluene 
TNT portion of the plant in particular was located on the northeastern slopes of Bunker Hill, specifically because if there were ever an accident and that portion of the establishment blew up, Trenton would be protected by the hill. Not too many years later, the grim wisdom of the planners would be borne out. In total, British Chemical actually operated five separate but interconnecting plants on the Trenton property. As might be expected, people who resided in the area at the time all remember the TNT portion, perhaps because its existence was the most feared. The other four, however, were equally important. The sulfuric acid plant, the nitric acid plant, the gun cotton or pyrocotton plant, and the smokeless powder plant. All had been completed and all were in operation within two years of their conception, despite some of the most serious construction obstacles and wasteful business practices imaginable. Because there were hundreds and, well, 3,000 people worked there. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of Chinese and uh, Macedonians, I believe, and, uh, and of course a lot of Canadians. And the idea of them, it was big money. And uh, double time or triple time on a Sunday, I think they might have made 75 cents an hour uh, if you came in on a Sunday and worked uh, eight, 10 hours or whatever it was. It was a damn shame the way they threw money around out there. The whole thing was cost plus. If a guy had $50 coming to him, he was liable to get a check for 150 If he complained, they told him to mind his own business. I knew a lot of guys who checked in in the morning and then left afterwards and went downtown and played pool all day. At the end of the day, they showed up as if they'd been there the whole time. Others had full-time jobs elsewhere but they got full pay at the chemical plant as well. Company didn't care. It was the British government that was paying the shot. Roley Whitley. Because of the massive labor influx, quality control among the builders was secondary to production. Many who had never driven a nail were called carpenters. Others who didn't know how to mix cement became masons, and dozens who couldn't thread a pipe were plumbers. Some of the problems were unavoidable. For one thing, the ground in the area was largely rocky shale, which was extremely difficult to excavate. Single foundation walls, 300 and more feet in length, had to be constructed and excavations blasted out of the rock. Miles of tunnels had to be drilled for water, heat, sewage and acid pipes. Even holes for hydro and telephone poles had to be dynamited. Unexpected problems occurred because of weather. The 1915 and 1916 winters were unusually severe in Trenton. Carpenters accustomed to working indoors found themselves trying to frame buildings in howling blizzards and driving nails with frozen hands. Each week, scores of men left jobs because the cold made it impossible to continue. Yet somehow, the massive building program went ahead. After all, the war was on in Europe, and the output of this plant was vital to the Allied cause. Construction workers came from all over Ontario, Quebec, the Maritimes, and many parts of the northern United States. These hundreds of men poured into Trenton by every means possible, signed on at the plant, and then tried to find accommodation. Huge barracks housing 1,000 men and more were thrown up and filled before they were finished. Hundreds of men boarded in town, packed the hotels or slept in tents, garages, attics, and church halls. Some even resided in abandoned railway cars. Men who worked different shifts slept in the same beds on a rotation basis. 1,000 men shifts, three shifts a day, seven days a week. No time off was the order of the day. British Chemical helped more than just those in the construction trades. Local accountants, doctors, police officers, and firefighters were able to obtain jobs in their own field at the plant. In the town, grocers, restaurant owners, shoe store operators, and hotel keepers all gained. Area farmers sold meat and produce to the company at prices unmatched elsewhere. To everyone, it seemed they had benefited from this great plant, which made Trenton the explosives capital of Canada. Unfortunately, the benefits were short-lived.
Men who had helped build the plant knew the danger. Others, when they understood the volatility of the products made there, sought jobs elsewhere. Stories of accidents and near accidents abounded, but seemed to have been muted because of the necessity for secrecy in a wartime defense industry. If there was an accident or a fire, the alarm whistle sounded, the victim was removed or the blaze extinguished, and then work resumed. There were so many acid burns of varying degrees of seriousness that apart from having his wounds tended, the injured party was soon forgotten, as was the need to take precautions in order to prevent a recurrence of the same thing. We were walking past one of the big acid tanks when it started to overheat. The acid was bubbling up inside and making a racket because the top of the tank was open. There was a scaffold or cat rock around the top and a workman standing on it. Just as he looked down into the tank, it caught fire. The boiling acid then began to pour over the top guy up there yelled a warning, so we got out of there in a hurry. Then the poor chap fell as he got, was getting down. He hit the ground hard, and I guess he must have broken his back or something, but this time he was screaming because he couldn't get up. I think he knew he was going to die, and knew there was no way anyone could get near to him to save him. The flames were shooting up in the air, and the acid from the tank was really gushing down. And then it poured over him, and his screaming stopped. The poor bugger didn't have a chance. I'll never forget seeing that. Roly Whitley. In all probability, others likely lost their lives in much the same way, or from actually falling into the huge vats. After the destruction of the place, men who worked cleaning up the plant site told of finding zippers from pants and metal fasteners from overalls in the bottom of drained acid tanks. British Chemical didn't have a stellar safety record and for the most part, didn't keep records. Security was always an issue at the plant, which was surrounded by fence, barbed wire, and the company had its own paramilitary security force. Electrocutions and other industrial accidents plagued construction. All workers had to enter the plant through a main gate and be scrutinized by sentries on duty. One guard had shot himself in the hand, subsequently losing the hand, and two others had deserted their post and were captured in Castleton. In an unfortunate incident, oh! Private Horace Creasy, an 18-year-old guard at the plant, shot and killed an older worker named Thomas Lapointe, who had refused to show his identifying pass to the young private. Oh! Private Creasy was charged with manslaughter. The nitrating plant itself was not without previous incident with fires breaking out as well as fires at the TNT plant. On December 6, 1917, a very serious explosion occurred which claimed the life of three young men and seriously injured six others. The men, referred to as the Perth Boys, had only been on the job for a week before they were killed. The press reported little and were probably told less. It's hard to say how many fatalities occur, but rumors always speculated there were far more than reported, especially among foreign and undocumented workers from all over the world who had flocked here for work. Other munition plant explosions were also not uncommon, from an accident in some cases and sabotage in others. The National Shell Filing Factory, Chilwell, on the 20th of August, 1918. Scotland Yard was called in to investigate an alleged sabotage. However, the more likely explanation is lack safety standards, as the workforce competed to meet increasingly challenging production targets, coupled with the instability of the TNT compound. Black Tom Explosion, Jersey City, New Jersey on the 30th of July, 1916. Sabotage by German agents caused 1,000 short tons of TNT to explode. There were few deaths, but about 100 injuries. Damage included buildings on Ellis Island, parts of the Statue of Liberty, and much of Jersey City. Silvertown Explosion, 
in East London on the 19th of January, 1917. Parts of Silvertown were devastated by a TNT explosion at the munitions factory. 73 people died and hundreds were injured. The blast was felt across London and Essex, with the resulting fires visible for 30 miles. Split Rock Explosion near Syracuse, New York, on the 2nd of July, 1918. A munitions factory exploded after a mixing motor in the main TNT building overheated. The fire rapidly spread through the wooden structure of the main factory, which leveled the structure and killed 50 workers. Morgan Depot Explosion in Sayreville, New Jersey, on the 4th of October, 1918. An ammunition plant exploded and triggered a fire. The facility, said to be one of the largest in the world at the time, was destroyed, along with more than 300 buildings. Over 100 people died in this accident. A total of 12 million pounds of explosives were destroyed. TNT was first prepared in 1863 by German chemist Julius Wilbrand and originally used as yellow dye. TNT can be safely poured as a liquid into shell cases. TNT is produced in a three-step process which uses toluene, which is a solvent, sulfuric and nitric acid, then finally adding oleum, which is a strong corrosive acid. All of the ingredients used in the process are highly volatile, corrosive, poisonous, and flammable. The rinse water from the production of TNT is a substance called red water, considered one of the most toxic pollutants known. Control of mixing temperature is vital. The reaction is highly volatile and carries with it the risk of a runaway reaction leading to an explosion. Many parts of the plant, although separate from the TNT manufacturing, were used in the production of ingredients and were fed to the TNT plant by various methods such as trams, boxes, above ground piping and rail car. The remaining buildings on the site produced gun cotton, another type of explosive propellant which uses cotton or microfibers soaked in sulfuric or nitric acid and are widely used in naval mines and torpedoes. Also made was pyrocotton, similar to gun cotton but with a different nitrogen content and used with smokeless powder. And smokeless powder, also known as cordite, which is a replacement for black powder and produces less smoke on the battlefield. It is clear to us now, 100 years later, to see how hazardous and dangerous the entire area was. But at the time the plant reached its full production, the fear had dissipated somewhat, only to be replaced by a fierce company loyalty on the part of the employees. In a single month, the plant was capable of producing 8 million pounds of sulfuric acid, 5 million pounds of nitric acid, 2,200,000 pounds of pyrocotton, 1,500,000 pounds of nitrocellulose powder, 1,200,000 pounds of TNT. If we consider the last figure itself, we can readily understand the fear which the plant inspired. The plant's monthly revenue of $2 million made the operation fairly lucrative for the owners. Before and after the disaster, soil contamination at the plant must have been extensive, long-term health effects unrecorded. The workers' health and soil contamination at the time were considered forms of collateral damage of the Great War. I went into work one night and the shirt and pants I was wearing were navy blue. But there were so many fumes in the air that night that when I got out the next morning, my clothes were pink. The color was taken right out of them. For this reason, men who were employed in what was called the nitrating section of the place wore clothing made of wool. The acid had less effect on it. Rubber boots worn by the men in the same section were generally white because the acid would bleach the other colors out. Matches and any form of metal that could cause sparks were strictly forbidden. Even outside the place, the fumes were noticeable. People downwind from the plant could smell it, but learned to live with the smell. Much of the vegetation in the area was also affected. Fruit trees were particularly vulnerable, to the extent 
the company would later compensate farmers for the losses caused by the poisoned air. Because the TNT was the most feared substance made at Trenton, freight cars carrying it were moved away from the site rather quickly. Much of this explosive was transported to East Coast ports where it was loaded onto ships. On the morning of December 6, 1917, an accident at Halifax provided a somber warning to Trenton and to those who worked at British Chemical. For on that day, a French ship loaded with explosives, including 220 tons of TNT made at Trenton, collided with a Norwegian vessel in Halifax Harbor in what has become known as the Halifax Explosion. At 7 p.m. that fateful night, the phone rang in the Trenton home of Mr. H. L. Druggan, who was superintendent of the TNT portion of the British Chemical Plant. The caller breathlessly informed Druggan that the plant was on fire and told him to come up right away. Just as he got to the company gate, he met several of the men from the nitrator section streaming out. They held a hurried conference. They were joined by other officials, including Charles N. Barkley, the general manager of the entire Trenton operation. They explained the seriousness of the situation to their two superiors, and Barclay took over from that point on. He immediately released all remaining workmen from their duties, and though most took the opportunity to leave, there were several who volunteered to remain behind in order to attempt to save what they could. Most of these would later be officially recognized for their courage, but there is at least one man whose actions saved countless lives who was never given the recognition he deserved. For if it was not for the quick thinking and resourcefulness of a railroad engineer by the name of Joe Barry, the city of Trenton might not even exist today. Less than 75 feet from the flames, two boxcars, fully loaded with TNT, were sitting on a rail siding. Joe Barry knew where the TNT was because he had moved dozens of carloads of it away in previous weeks. He raced across the property to an idling yard engine he climbed into the cab and with the assist of a companion who operated track switches, maneuvered the locomotive around to the east side of Bunker Hill. With apparent disregard for his own safety, took the engine through the dense smoke and acid fumes toward the train cars. By this time, the flames were only a few feet from the TNT. Barry had the cars coupled to his engine and was slowly easing them away from the fire. As the smoke and fumes swirled around him, he held his breath and removed the danger, and in so doing, saved Trenton from being most likely blown off the map. General Manager Barkley remained at the plant and continued to direct salvage operations. He reasoned that if some of the overhead wooden trestles which connected a number of company buildings could somehow be removed, perhaps some of the British chemical operation could be saved. Already, flames had scooted along some of the trestles and engulfed sections of the plant that might otherwise have been untouched. Each time volunteers had tried to sever these links, however, heat from the flames and even bigger explosions had driven them back. Finally, three men who had watched the earlier attempts fail decided to see what they could do. Murray, Moncrief, and Enterline began working their way around the gun cotton lines toward the high wooden trestles that carried the acid. They breathed through soaked handkerchiefs as they went. Flames from the cotton buildings a mere 50 feet away made progress slow, <coughs> difficult, and dangerous. Through the searing heat, smoke, fumes, and flying embers which added to the terror of the mission, the three managed to reach their objective. They hacked at the huge trestle with axes they carried, managed to weaken it, then ran for their lives as it fell. Curtis, the telephone operator, stayed at her post and refused to leave her station, keeping the lines of communication open. 
As the roaring inferno engulfed building after building, all the while coming closer to her office, and despite explosions, fire, glass blowing past her, the switchboard was never closed. For this reason, she was the first Canadian woman to receive the Order of the British Empire Medal for Bravery. She, along with seven others, were rewarded the Medal of the Order of the British Empire for staying in the danger zone throughout the horrors of the night. For conspicuous bravery and courage on the occasion of a fire and explosion at the Trenton Munition Factory. In Belleville, Picton, and Coburg, there are people who recall the color of the sky that October night. Many of them also remember seeing the enormous explosions, and in Belleville at least, actually feeling the shock as various sections of the British chemical plant blew sky high. Dishes rattled in cupboards, telephones mysteriously rang by themselves, Dogs barked at the accustomed sensation, and people rushed out of doors and stood in groups talking to neighbors about the terrible things that were happening. From Carrying Place, Frankfurt, and Brighton, people telephoned relatives in Trenton, and when call after call brought no response, they feared for the lives of their loved ones. Eight times that night, horrendous explosions rent the sky like a giant fireworks display gone mad. With each blast, flying timbers, glass, jagged pieces of steel, clods of earth, and massive hunks of broken concrete showered the plant property, the river, and a good deal of the north end of the town. Rumors spread through the district with the same speed that the fire had raked the slopes of Bunker Hill. And at Bayside, Glen Miller, and Consecon, frightened citizens watched the explosions and believed Trenton was no more. People told me after reading book, they remember talking to their grandparents or parents, uh, if the parents were fairly elderly, about stuff that was found, you know, uh, a kilometer in those days, a mile or so from the plant, and maybe sometimes farther. That obviously didn't belong there, and you know, a chunk of a railway track. Uh, somebody told me that uh, they said maybe two feet long, uh, this, this chunk of steel that was blown a long, long way. So it, it was a colossal explosion. Chief Smith of the fire brigade at the plant remained at the heart of the wreckage throughout the night. I never want to go through anything like that again. The explosions hurled acid and oil tanks high into the air. It may have been beautiful, but it was pitiful to see it all go up. When the first explosion shook the area, house after house, men, women, and children went into the streets and headed out of town, anywhere out of town. Horses were frantically harnessed and hitched to buggies, wagons, carts, anything that would move. Cars and trucks of every description rattled and backfired down through the clogged streets. Women pushed baby carriages and carried infants. Fathers piggybacked young children and urged older ones to run into the darkness. Shouting, screaming, crying, cursing, and praying were all sounds intermingled in the cacophony of terror. But the old and the ill suffered the most. Not long before the Great Fire, a serious influenza outbreak spread through central Ontario the Spanish flu. Many people died either of the flu or other illnesses which struck those already overcome by the flu. <coughs> Hospitals were jammed and only those who were unable to care for themselves were admitted. In almost every home in the district, at least one family member had contracted the illness. No one appeared to be immune because as many youngsters as older people were affected. Trenton was heavily hit. The, the Spanish flu uh, was worldwide. It, it was, uh, it, it killed I said, probably millions in, in virtually every country. A lot of people that I interviewed talked about being sick with the Spanish flu. Certainly, on the night of the Great Explosion, many Trentonians were so sick that the chemical plant fire was just one more annoyance they did not need. Local businessman, Grant Rathburn, was one of them. 
I was a little shaver at the time. I had the flu. So did my sister and my mother. We were in bed in a house on Spring Street. We had a nurse looking after us at the time because of my mother's illness. When the explosion started to go off, my dad, who did not have the flu, saw the people storming past our place and on out of town. My mother, myself, and my sister were begging my father to take us out, but he said he wouldn't because we might get sicker than we already were. The house was shaking and we were scared, but my dad would not take us anywhere, so we stayed put for the night. Then at last, it was over. The fire was almost out. The last explosion had echoed across the Trent Valley. The thousands of people who had sought refuge in hotels, farmhouses, and fields started streaming homewards. Some of them had returned twice, once during the night, and a second time a few hours after the biggest explosion of all, at 6.20 in the morning. When the morning blast came, a rumor swept through town that an even more terrible blow-up was yet to come. The story was believed, and the second evacuation took place. This time, nothing happened. The rumor was just that, a rumor. A great deal of damage to the town. And now, uh, from the town bridge up to the where the Bank of Montreal used to be, and maybe it still is, uh, that would be the south side of the street. Uh, pretty well every window in every store was blown out. And uh, that's one example. Uh, other people told me that they lived, you know, farther than, away than that, and the chimney was, uh, you know, broken down on their house. It fell down. Uh, others found chunks of steel or chunks of debris of various sorts. Undis they couldn't explain what it was in their lawn afterwards, or uh, wedged into the side of a house or their house. Uh. W. H. Ireland. Trenton's mayor at the time, was instrumental in playing down many of the false reports of death and injury. A press conference which he held right after the fire did much to set the record straight. He was also credited with instituting an immediate block-by-block -block cleanup campaign. Trentonians began assessing the damage to their town. Almost every pane of glass was broken in the place, and hundreds of chimneys were leveled. The downtown core looked as if it had been bombed. At the plant itself, a wasteland of charred rubble, warped steel bars, blackened girders, and jagged hunks of cement were all that remained of parts of the factory, which had been fully operational a day earlier. Gaping craters, shredded and burnt tree trunks, tangled power lines, and melted electrical insulators were everywhere. Incinerated boxcars stood on twisted tracks. And the place was empty. down expenses, so they say, to save a few odd millions more or less. They want to scrap the Navy, do they? Yes. Newly uncovered documents show that extensive political and financial pressures were being made on the financial debt-ridden British Treasury at the time of the explosion. By 1916, Britain was funding most of the Empire's war expenditures, all of Italy's and two-thirds of the war costs of France and Russia. The gold reserves, overseas investments, and private credit then ran out, forcing Britain to borrow $4 billion from the U.S. Treasury in 1917-1918. Shipments of American raw materials and food allowed Britain to feed itself and its army while maintaining her productivity. The financing was generally successful, and the United States' entry into the war may have been viewed as a way to protect their investment. In September 1917, a great push was on by Canada to start munitions export to the U.S. as they dropped tariffs on munitions. Canada had always only dealt with contracts funded by Britain. So, with England reluctant to incur more debt to the U.S., it urged its allies to apply for credit directly to the U.S. However, the U.S. would not credit allies like Italy without loan guarantees from England, essentially pressuring the already debt-ridden English Treasury. So after the initial contract for British Chemical to supply Italy with high explosives was complete, 
and the British Treasury refusing to fund Italy anymore. The pressure mounted on the management of British Chemical to find buyers for TNT, which was starting to accumulate at an alarming rate. Britain was not willing to build additional magazines for storing the explosives at Trenton, and was more than happy to start supplying the US Navy with all of the Trenton plant output. In a far-reaching decision of the Inter-Allied Munition Council in Paris the 13th of August 1918, the Council ordered and allotted the entire output of Trenton to Italy. The US, unwilling to finance Italy directly without British guarantees, effectively stalled all negotiations, while in the meantime receiving the total output of the Trenton plant, which was favorable to the British Treasury. However, this ploy could only go on so long before the Council forced the matter because of Italian complaints. By the 11th of October, things were getting critical for plant management, with stockpiles of TNT accumulating to dangerous amounts in open storage, and a besieged British government with a choice of increasing its debt to the US by having to finance Italy, or decreasing it by selling to the Americans in opposition to the Allied Munition Council's decision, or close the plant. From a letter to R.H. Brand from the British Treasury Department on the 11th of October on whether Canada could finance the Italians themselves. Dear Brand, many thanks for your letter of the second instant respecting the provision of Canadian supplies for the Italians. We could accept without any difficulty the principle which you suggest as a guiding one, but in our opinion, the application of this principle in the manner which you suggest to Canada is impossible. The fact being that if Italy is to have Canadian dollars, they are not lent by Canada, but by the United States to the British government. This indirect assumption of what are strictly Italian or French obligations to the United States government is consistently opposed by us. Further, it is strictly true that we cannot find the dollars required, and it is obviously true so long as we are borrowing money from the United States for expenditure in Canada. As you are aware, we borrow regularly to the ex extent of at least $15 million a month, and the purchase of wheat will probably absorb another $100 million. You will realize, therefore, that good use can be found for the surplus, a very welcome one, which the IMB has available. I gathered from my telephone conversation with you that the alternatives were three. One, to stop manufacture. Two, to sell to the Italians. Three, to sell to the United States. Presumably you are reluctant to adopt the first. We are strongly opposed to the second. We should welcome the adoption of the third. Yours sincerely, Andrew McFadden. However, the destruction of most of the factory three days after this letter, that fateful Thanksgiving, seemed to fortunately leave everyone off the hook, perhaps an unspoken fourth alternative. Also, in a fortunate coincidence, the two main Canadian officials responsible for the British Chemical Company plant, including Mr. Noble Peary and Sir Joseph Flavel's personal assistant, Mr. Fitzgerald, were traveling by train to Trenton on the very day of the explosion and were able to complete the investigation as the plant still smoldered. The official line of authorities was to suppress much of the information about the disaster. Plant manager Barclay and director Peary refused to release the names of the workers being blamed for the accident. The investigation findings and report were completed in less than 24 hours and the insurance claim filed by the British government was paid out soon after. The media blackout led to a number of theories about what happened. There was much public display and news from factory officials about rebuilding the plant, but official documents now show that it was never seriously considered by the British Ministry. So, with the declaration of an armistice and the end of the Great War on the 11th of November, a mere three weeks later, the accident was soon forgotten. I couldn't confirm the fact that uh, the 
explosion itself and the reason behind it could have been deliberate. I, I strongly feel that there might have been something to that, but I couldn't prove it or disprove it. Uh, the war was coming to an end. They were making all this explosive materials. It wasn't going to be needed. Uh, the war ended, as we know, soon afterwards. And uh, I still think in the back of my mind, somebody in Britain likely gave the word, okay, let's uh, get rid of that plant. Now, whether they, they meant it literally or not, I don't know, but I've always wondered that ever since I was researching the book. Rumors about the explosion still circulate in Trenton, and many people there have their own theories as to what really happened at the plant that Thanksgiving night in 1918. The ministry quickly paid out settlements for plate glass and other damages, and by July 1919, claims had totaled more than $54,000. One claim went on until 1927 for the losses to an orchard nearby. Much of the remaining raw materials were snapped up quickly by U.S. companies. And by the end of 1919, the British government would no longer be in the munitions business in Canada, selling parts of the plant to private companies. The plant was heavily insured in England, and the munitions ministry would collect their settlement before the year's end. Some $4 million on a plant they spent $5 million to buy. Other rumors and stories told of tunnels filled with smokeless powder that still remained buried, and the fact that 22 men never reported to pick up their paychecks after the accident. Unfortunately, it is now doubtful if anyone will ever know enough about the sequence of events, the personnel involved, or the economic climate of the area during the last weeks of the life of the plant to make an in-depth assessment of the explosion and all the factors that led up to it. Officially, the fire was an accident, an error in judgment on the part of one man. Sixty-five years later, a cleanup of the area was conducted. The work started in late 1980, after the public notified the Explosives Branch of Energy Mines and Resources Canada about the presence of explosives in the soil. Ruins were leveled, brush cleared, and a geotextile membrane was put in place over the largest concentrations of TNT still existing. The membrane, covered by 60 centimeters of gravel, and 15 centimeters of topsoil was considered sufficient to stop the TNT from making its way to the surface anymore. So today, 100 years after it was destroyed, a lot of questions about Trenton, Ontario's largest and most controversial industry still remain. And while they likely will remain unanswered, it will probably continue to flourish, just like the grass which grows among the ruins on Bunker Hill.